Hello everyone. I'm here. You're there. We should be together. We're apart. Blame the world and the state that it's in that I refuse to travel anywhere except to a studio to give a speech. Anyway, we are together and we're going to have fun for the next hour or so. Here we go. In 1983, when my book, Possum Magic, my first book, was only seven months old, but already, you know, really famous, I was invited to an elementary school, a primary school. It, as an author, it was very exciting. The visit went well, and at the end of the visit, I was asked if, I, no, a child was asked, sorry, to take me back to the car. She was adorable. And as she took me back to the car, she took her hand in mine, and she said, Mrs. Memphark, I thought you were dead. Well, it's 37 years later, and I'm still not dead. I'm still here, and I'm still passionate about the whole read aloud thing, by which I mean reading to children regularly and with vitality from the moment they're born, all the way through to five years old before they start school, and then, of course, at school for many years afterwards, but certainly in the first three years of school, reading to them regularly. I'm crazy about that stuff. Now, I know you will have heard me speak before because I have spoken a thousand million times around the world. So today you will hear me saying the same things that I've been banging on about for the whole of my life. But pardon me for boring the pants off you, okay? I'm sorry, but I am just going to go for it today. Summing up everything, calling my presentation the end of life presentation as a joke. I'm in perfect health. I'm in perfect health. Anyway, here we go. Um, I've been around long enough to wish that I had kept all the emails and the photos uh, sent to me over the years, which showed babies, little tiny babies, um, as young as three months, already absolutely wrapped in books. Each sender of those emails and each sender of those photos, you know, if the child was eight months, 10 months, three months, you know, the child's riveted on the book. Each of those parents thought their child was particularly special and particularly amazing to be so interested in books at, some, at such a young age. However, I know that those babies were not particularly special. They're not particularly amazing because all babies who are read to regularly absolutely adore books. I also know how lucky those children were, those babies were, and what a wonderful difference it will make to their lives to have been read to so often by someone who loved them, someone who adored them, and someone that they loved. But, you know, parents who don't read to their babies and toddlers find it really hard to believe. I mean, they just don't believe that children are able and willing to be intensely absorbed in storybooks at such an early age. The parents who don't read to their children don't understand the multiple benefits of reading to a child. They don't grasp the happiness of it, they don't grasp the joy of it, so they miss out on a lot of fun. Now, the same can be said of some teachers. They don't understand the multiple benefits of reading to children. They don't grasp the happiness and the joy of it all, so they miss out on a lot of fun and a lot of important ed educational outcomes as well. You know, when you talk about airy-fairy things to these people, you know, you say joy, you say fun, they go, Ugh. and it just doesn't cut it with them. It just doesn't. Those two words mean nothing to some educators. They absolutely refuse to acknowledge, or they have forgotten the fundamental role of the affective in education, you know, the role of the emotions in learning anything. <sighs> My dad, who was an inspiring teacher of teachers, taught his students that a laughing child likes learning, and that is a maxim I have lived by myself in my own teaching. A laughing child likes learning. After all, a failing child hates learning. A failing child is unhappy. A 
A failing child is ashamed. A failing child is too tense to learn. A failing child is too tense to even want to learn. So, I may not live as long as I thought I was going to live with the virus and everything, being an old and chronic asthmatic, but this presentation is going to be a summing up, as I told you, and I will not be tactful today. I am actually sick to death of being tactful about the teaching of reading. So, you know, I'm going to go out on a bang today. Tact, whit, out the window. All right. If you are not reading very often to your students, uh, I'll be explaining why it might be a good idea to read to your students, no matter what age they are, for the sake of their relaxation, the sake of their contentment, as well as their literacy. I also hope to demonstrate what a calming, soothing activity it is for you as a teacher or a teacher of teachers. Never mind the children. It's just lovely, lovely for us. It's lovely. Take this book, for instance, as a soothing antidote to the woes of the world that we currently live in, in September 2020. This book is called Whoever You Are. It is illustrated by Leslie Staub. When I took it off the shelf last night, I was so excited to see that the copy that I had taken off the shelf was the one signed to me by Leslie Storb herself, the illustrator. I was thrilled, and I was actually even more thrilled to see what she had said. Dear Mem, thank you so much for writing this lovely book, and thank you for sharing yourself with the world. Doing this book was a moment of grace for me. Your kindness, intelligence, and generosity of spirit are an inspiration not to mention the inspiration I get from the gorgeously elegant simplicity of your work. With great joy and immense gratitude, Leslie Storb. Now, who wouldn't love a woman like that? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Whoever you are. Little one, whoever you are, Wherever you are, there are little ones just like you all over the world. Their skin may be different from yours, and their homes may be different from yours. Their schools may be different from yours, and their lands may be different from yours. Their lives may be different from yours, and their words may be very different from yours, but inside, their hearts are just like yours. Whoever they are, wherever they are, all over the world. Their smiles are like yours and they laugh just like you. Their hurts are like yours and they cry like you too, whoever they are wherever they are, all over the world. Little one, when you are older and when you are grown, you may be different and they may be different. Wherever you are, wherever they are in this big wide world. But remember this, joys are the same and love is the same, pain, is the same, and blood is the same, smiles are the same, and hearts are just the same, wherever they are, wherever you are. Oh. Smiles are the same, and hearts are the same, Wherever they are, wherever you are, all over the world. So that's the soothing, serene sort of feeling 
that we might want at a particular moment. But what if things have got a bit dull during the day? What about that? Well, we can have a noisy book. And this is an example. This one is called uh, The Magic Hat. And it's illustrated by Tricia Tusa, who used to live in Texas, but now lives in New Mexico. I loved it when she lived in Texas, because you could say Tricia Tusa from Texas. It sounded great. I love the pictures anyway, Tricia, even though you moved to New Mexico. OK, The Magic Hat. Here we go. One fine day from out of town and without any warning at all, there appeared a magic hat. Oh, the magic hat, the magic hat. It moved like this, it moved like that. It spun through the air and over a road and sat on the head of a warty old toad. Oh, the magic hat, the magic hat. It moved like this, it moved like that. It spun through the air and over, it spun through the air like a bouncing balloon and sat on the head of a hairy baboon. Oh, the magic hat, the magic hat. It moved like this, it moved like that. It spun through the air from way over there and sat on the head of a sleepy old bear. Oh, the magic hat, the magic hat. It moved like this, it moved like that. It spun through the air, it's true, it's true, and sat on the head of a kangaroo. Oh, the magic hat, the magic hat. It moved like this, it moved like that. It spun through the air for a mile and a half and sat on the head of a lofty giraffe. And then, with a skip, and then, with a hop, a wizard appeared with a sign that said, stop. So everyone stopped and stared in surprise at the wonderful wizard with sparkling eyes who took from his beard with a nod and a wink a wand which he waved. And what do you think? The toad, the baboon, the bear, and the roo and of course, the giraffe, for what are to do, turned back into people, dazed and confused, watched by a crowd that was highly amused. While no one was looking. The wizard, meanwhile, skipped out of town with a mischievous smile. And of course, on his head, was the fabulous hat that made all the magic wherever it It is a massive boost to children's literacy if they've heard a thousand stories read aloud before they begin to learn to read themselves. Now, you know, when people hear a thousand stories, you know, there's a sort of, oh no, oh good grief, a thousand stories. How can they read a thousand stories before they start to learn to read? However, if parents are reading two or three stories a night to the children that they love and who are in their households, um, it will take 10 or 12 minutes per night. That's all, even the same story three times, which is even better. The repetition is fantastic. You know, if this is happening to little kids in their homes, they have learned to read. They have, sorry, they haven't learned to read. That's exactly what they haven't done. They have heard a thousand stories read to them. By the time they're 11 months old, which kid is going to start learning to read at 11 months? Nobody. I mean, if you can hear a thousand stories by the time you're one, you know, you're going to hear a thousand stories by the time you're five with great ease, provided someone is reading to you before you learn to read yourself. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
that's why we're here today, talking to each other, what happens when children hit school? What should we be doing as teachers if we discover that many of our students in kindergarten, first and second grade have no books at home, are never read to, and have never been read to by anyone, ever? What if they come to school without that background of a thousand stories, as so many children do, you know that? Are we going to throw our hands in the air and then teach them the benighted alphabet one letter at a time for 26 weeks and hope that that's going to get us somewhere? Are we going to do that? No, we are not. Good grief. Are we going to start? with these poor children who have no background of stories being read to them, are we going to start with something as tedious and as damaging to their enthusiasm, their win willingness to learn? Are we going to start with something as disconnected as phonics and senseless school readers? Is that what we're going to start with? No, 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 again. We are not starting there. There is no way out, people. There is absolutely no way out. Reading to children is a major strategy in their learning to read. Honestly, it is. It has to be accepted by every teacher of every young child. It has to be accepted as fundamental to literacy teaching, and it has to be adopted by administrators, by curriculum writers, by everyone who's putting things into schools, it has to be adopted, you know, by people who, I mean, some people who are making the rules about what happens in schools have, for a start, never taught a class, which is, you know, why they don't know how kids learn best. They've got no idea how kids learn best because they've never taught a class. Um, but if they did know it, because they've been out of the classroom for so long, they have forgotten, you know, how children learn. We, we really need to get back to the child and the needs of the child. You know, we need to get out of the office, into the classroom, sit down in front of children and find out what they love doing and how they can learn best. When we're teaching reading, instead of being dead serious all the time, oh God, we're so serious about the teaching of reading. We are occasionally as teachers being as boring to our children as a long sermon. Listen, we need to romp around a bit more. We need to have fun with books. It will bond us to our students. We'll have lots of laughs. They will love us. We'll get to know them better. They'll get to know us. We'll create a family in the classroom. We'll have this warm relationship between the kids, between us. It'll be lovely. And this class that these children are in, this teacher who is teaching them, will be remembered forever in their lives. When they meet up with people who were in that class, as they remember so and so, how she read to us, oh, she was so fantastic. I love that she was my favorite teacher. Look, if we read with joy and vitality, joy in our hearts, vitality in our voices, the sulking of some children, you know those sulky children, you know they sit there, they're absolutely unwilling to learn. Um, these sulking children, may have their fear and, well, will, should have their fear and resistance to books and reading lessened over time, enabling even the most disadvantaged children, the most disadvantaged, the ones who come from the poorest homes, the ones who come from the richest homes which have no books, the, the ones who come to school without English being their first language, the ones who come to school not able to speak English at all on their first day. All of these children, if we read to them, have the ability to creep towards literacy, to make progress in learning to read without noticing it almost, without noticing that it is happening. For many such children, a simple, simple, short, rhyming, rhythmic, repetitive book such as this, there are many, there are many, but such as this may be the first book that they can read by themselves, because it's so simple. It's like a reader, but it's a thousand times better. This book is called Where is the Green Sheep? And it is illustrated by Judy Horacek. I, I Mem Fox, and Judy Horacek both live 
in Australia, in case you hadn't realized that. Here we are. Where is the green sheep? Here is the blue sheep, and here is the red sheep. Here is the bath sheep, and here is the bed sheep. But where is the green sheep? Here is the thin sheep, and here is the wide sheep. Here is the swing sheep, and here is the side sheep. But where is the green sheep? Here is the up sheep, and here is the down sheep. Here is the band sheep, and here is the clown sheep. But where is the green sheep? Here is the sun sheep, and here is the rain sheep. Here is the car sheep. And here is the train sheep. But where is the green sheep? Here is the wind sheep. And here is the wave sheep. Here is the scared sheep. And here is the brave sheep. But where is the green sheep? Here is the near sheep. And here is the far sheep. Here is the moon sheep. And here is the star sheep. But where is the green sheep? Here is the sand pit sheep and the angel sheep and the tired and emotional sheep and the narcissistic sheep, and the birthday party sheep. Where is that green sheep? Turn the page quietly. Let's take a peep. Here's our green sheep, vast. Rhyme, rhythm, and repetition are very, very important in teaching reading and in learning to read. Children who can rhyme and who have a strong sense of rhythm always find learning to read easier than the children who can't rhyme and the children who don't have a sense of rhythm. If children know six nursery rhymes by the time they're four by heart, they're usually in the top reading group by the time they're eight. This is the importance of having a sense of rhyme and a sense of rhythm, an ability to hear that Ted and Bed rhyme. It's actually much more important than we would believe. Of course, there are exceptions to these children, um, and these are children born with dyslexia, which is a well-known neurological disorder. It exists. Do not deny that dyslexia exists. When we read the rhymes and rhythms in a book like The Magic Hat or in The Green Sheep, for example, there is so much more happening, people. There's so much more happening than mere enjoyment. It's not just about joy. It's not just about fun, even though those two things are fantastically important. It's educationally, it's a fantastic thing to do, but always, always the main reason we're reading is because we want to create for students a very calm and happy situation that is relaxing and as rewarding for us as it is for them, especially if we're having a bad day in the classroom or we've just had a bad moment where somebody has lost it completely. It could be you or me, the teacher, you know, it could be us who have lost it. Um, but a kid could just go wild and something, and it's all horrible, it's all horrible. Whatever's gone on, it's all horrible. Now, if you then start a story, for example, the beginning of Possum Magic goes like this. Once upon a time, but not very long ago, deep in the Australian bush lived two possums. Their names were Hush and Grandma Poss. Can you hear that the rhythm of the words 
is calming. And the children climb off the walls. They cannot resist. And they come and sit on the mat like lambs, quiet, listening, at peace. Although it has nothing to do with formal education, those read aloud moments and the joy, yes, that word again, joy, the joy that infuses those read aloud sessions makes a huge difference to children when they begin to learn to read. Most importantly, though, through books and stories, children learn how to speak. They learn how to talk. They learn words. They learn language. In our case, they learn the English language, the language they're going to use that they're going to need to know in order to be learned to read, in order to be able to learn to read in the countries that we live in that speak English. They learn how to speak more clearly. They learn how to speak more confidently. They develop a bigger and more subtle vocabulary, not only through the books and stories that they're listening to, but the chat, chat, chat between you and them and us. You know, that we're chatting in long sentences. We're not saying, what do you think is going to happen next? They're not saying, uh, why do you think, you know, the possums were made invisible? They're, it's not that kind of chat. It's, you know, what would you do, honey buns, if you were invisible? You know, what would you do? I know what I'd do. <laughs> I'd go into the chocolate shop and eat the chocolate. Uh, no, I wouldn't, because that would be awful. But what would you do if you were invisible? There's a lot of long sentence chat and the children are learning language through the chat of the books, around the books, not just through the books themselves. The vocabulary and the sentence structure in picture books for young children is, is known to be of the highest order. It is more nuanced, it is more original, it's more kind of high art language, it's more extensive even, than the language that is spoken between two people, two adults. It's better than the language spoken between two fluent adults because the writers who've written them work hard. It's not just the writers, it's the editors who are pains to writers because they make the writers write it again and again and again and again until the rhythm is perfect, until the word choice is exactly right. So these picture books have a heightened language and children who hear this heightened language have a massive number of words to think with, to express themselves with. They're therefore able to express their feelings better. They can say how they feel with nuanced language. They can express their needs more easily. They don't have to resort. If they want to get something or make a point, they don't have to resort to screaming or whining or physically lashing out. Wow, 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 isn't that what we want? Less whining, less lashing out. Bring out those picture books. There are thousands and thousands of them. Brilliant. Thanks to the editors in the publishing houses who boss the writers around. I speak from experience. Reading to children helps them to understand many things about language, not just language itself, not just language. As we read to them, they're picking up English grammar fast, they're also learning to predict and expect the way English works. They know that in English, we say the noun, the verb, and the object in that order. I love you. In Italian, it's quite different. It's ti amo, which is, in our way of speaking, back to front. You, I love. I mean, that's not the way we speak English. But, you know, English-speaking adults don't know or care most, of, most often. <laughs> they don't care when they're speaking whether there's a noun, object, verb, or whatever in the sentence, but they can still speak the language because they've heard it, they're familiar with it, aren't we? It's us, we're the English speakers in this room um, because we've used it, we've heard it. Now, the lucky ones, uh, the lucky English speakers who have been read to will have heard the very best of the English language from well-written books that they have listened to, and they will have a far greater command of English Forever, whatever their position in life is, they will have a far greater um, ability to speak clearly, confidently, fluently, and interestingly than the children who have not been read to. I remember um, reading a book to our grandson when he was little, 
And it was about a bear who had a friend who was a mouse, and the mouse was very talkative. And the bear foolishly invited mouse over for a sleepover. It was called A Bedtime for Bear by Brett Helquist. And the mouse just would not be quiet. It just kept talking and talking and talking, and bear was trying to go to sleep. And in the end, right across the page, it said, will this torment never cease? And that became a saying in our house. You know, when things were going wrong, we'd say, oh, will this torment never cease? When we were in a traffic jam, we would say, will this torment never cease? Um, it just became part of our language, and it would never have been part of our language if we had not read this beautiful picture book, which was hilarious. And of course, my grandson, you know, at the age of, you know, two months, I'm exaggerating massively, could read Will This Torment Never Cease? because it was across the double page spread of the book. Will This Torment Never Cease? You know, when kids see that again and again and again and again because they love the book and they want it read over and over and over and over, suddenly you've got a child who may not be able to read the rest of the book but can read Will This Torment Never Cease? Are you with me? Are you with me? Research has told us for years that it's much more important for children to be fluent in language before they come to school than it is for them to be familiar with the letters and the sounds that they make. I said that too fast. I'm going to read that slowly because it's important. Research has told us for years that it is much more important for children to be fluent in language before they come to school than it is for them to know the letters and the sounds they make. So, reading to them as soon as they get to school, as soon as they get to school, no matter what backgrounds they come from, is the way to go. They need to be able to talk before they can learn to read. So what are we going to do? We're going to give them words. We're going to give them sentences. We're going to give them phrases and ways of saying things differently. And how are we going to do this? By reading wonderful stories to them. We're going to read to them and read to them and read to them. Oh, yes, we are. What else happens when children listen to stories? What else is important in their eventual success at learning to read? Well, strangely, it's interesting. I find this one interesting. General knowledge is really important in learning to read. Now, why would general knowledge assist somebody in reading? Well, the more we know about the world, the easier it is to read about the world and anything in it, uh, you and me included, not just children who are learning to read. I mean, really, it's, it's all of us. The more we know about a subject, such as economics or Mozart or neuroscience, Star Wars, coronavirus, football, the American electoral system, Hunger Games, whatever, the easier it is to read about it. The more we know about it, the easier it is to read about it. If we're interested in COVID-19, and who isn't at this point in our lives, we're able to read words like infection, isolation, ventilators, denial, vaccine, death toll, and demonstration much more easily than if we haven't heard those words before on news bulletins. General knowledge of a subject makes reading about it very much easier. So, the more we read to children, the faster their general knowledge expands. A child who is familiar with the magic hat, for example, knows about a toad, a baboon, a kangaroo, a bear, and a giraffe. If they are familiar with whoever they are, they know early on that blood is the same among all the peoples of the world, and so on. Clearly, in order to increase their general knowledge, reading to children is the way to go. Now, those of you who are already reading to your children, those of you who are teaching teachers to read to your, their children, must be pretty pleased with the positive effect that you are having, knowing this, the effects of reading aloud. You must be very pleased with yourselves. However, let's move on. We've got two things under our belt so far, knowing how to speak English and having a wide general knowledge. Both of these are very important to reading. 
but they are only two of the three basic requirements we need in order to be able to read fluently. The third is, of course, phonics, the relationship between letters on the page and the sounds that those letters make and the sounds that the combinations of letters make. Phonics, by the way, is quite different from phonetics, which it's often confused with. Now, I know that you are either teaching teachers or you are teachers yourself. Oh, you, know, you don't need to ex have explained that phonics is not phonetics, but you know, this may have a wider audience and some people just don't know the difference. Don't call it phonetics, it's phonics, people. Phonics, phonics, phonics. The more we read to children, it stands to reason, the more they'll be exposed to hearing words at the same time as they see them, thereby making the connection with this letter, making that particular sound, or this shape of a word, making that particular meaning. Children who have been read to acquire a competence in phonics far more easily than children who haven't been read to. Obviously, it's pretty hard to read without seeing the letters on the page. So let's think about the printed words in where is the green sheep. The double E sound occurs multiple times in both green and sheep, E, E. In fact, it appears on nearly every page. In the word sheep, the children hear and simultaneously see the sh sound again and again and again, almost on every page. Where is the green sheep? Where is the green sheep? Where is the green sheep? They're learning phonics without realizing they're learning anything important and fundamental to reading. Obviously, it's best if you and I speak as clearly as possible so children can hear the beginnings and the ends of words especially. It's very important for us to speak clearly. Our clear speech helps a great deal with language development and the picking up of phonics. So, let's imagine everything that's going on in a child's brain when we read a very simple book like Where is the Green Sheep? The language learning happens, increasing of general knowledge happens, the grasping of phonics happens, especially in the sh in sheep and the e sound in sheep and green. Uh, so you can see, for all the reasons I've explained so far, that reading the same much-loved books to children over and over and over again is massively beneficial. You know, I get so sad when people say, oh, I read that, yes, I read that book every term. I read that book every semester to my students. I'm thinking to myself, whatever book it is, unless it's a novel, of course, I'm talking picture books, you read it once? <laughs> You read the book once. The whole point is to read the same books that the kids love over and over and over again till you're nearly going mental. You know, they're not going mental. They're learning a lot. Never mind that we go mental. We've got to read the same books again and again and again. You see, they see the words often. They hear the sounds of those words often. They see the letters at the same time. Their general knowledge is cemented. Their understanding and use of language is expanded. Huge benefits, huge benefits. Is it any wonder that the kids who've been read very simple books before they come to school over and over and over again can read those books before they get to school, before they get there? Because you and I find it easier to read anything we're already familiar with, such as you know, politics, football, where is the green sheep, you know, whatever it is, because we find it easier to read anything we are already familiar with, it stands to reason that the same must apply to children. If it applies to us, it applies to children. This is why it is so beneficial, and I'm going to speak slowly. This is why it is so beneficial to encourage parents to read a school reader, a basal reader, to their child before the child reads it to them for their homework. Do I hear an uproar? Do I hear an outcry? Read the reader to the child before the child reads it aloud to the parent? What, what, what? I know it sounds controversial. I know it does. I know it sounds like cheating. I know some people go crazy when they hear me saying that. But for heaven's sake, familiarity with the text 
prior to their trying to read it will give them a fizzy burst of excitement, a fizzy burst of confidence, a, a great willingness, a, a enthusiasm to read the book. They'll even have success even if the book is as tedious as most school readers are. And I think we can all agree on that. You know, they're not the best written books in the world. They're tedious. That's one reason why they're so difficult to read. But if we read the reader to them first, they will succeed. Instead of there being an outcry and an uproar, try the outcome. See what happens. They'll fly. Oh, my goodness. Another controversial little thing that I'm going to say. I told you I wasn't going to be tactful today. I told you tact was out the window. It's gone. No tact anywhere. If children are reading to you and they're reading a story and they're getting along quite well and quite fast and they're interested in the story and they come to a sort of block, they come to a word that they just think, oi, 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 what is this word? I cannot work out what this word is. Tell them the word while they're looking at the word. Don't let them take their eyes off the word. Just tell them the word. Just tell them what it is. And then they can move on and they can keep an interest in the story instead of sounding out every jolly word that they don't know, which will kill any enthusiasm. And we'll have this failing child who's ashamed, who's tense, who's miserable, who can't learn. Tell them the word while they are looking at it, and they will be able to read it the next time. Well, they'll be more able to read it the next time. I recall our daughter, aged six, reading the words. She was reading on video, on audio tape for my parents who lived in another country, and my husband was listening to her speak, right? So, was listening to her read. So she was reading the words Academy of Sciences at the age of six, in a picture book, mind you, you know, this is about the language of picture books and how sort of highfalutin it is. She was reading Academy of Sciences in Tommy Ungerer's picture book, The Beast of Monsieur Racine, a hilarious book. When she saw the words, the Academy of Sciences, she said, the Academy of Sinuses. My husband, who was not a teacher of reading at the time and still isn't, but somehow just worked magic with this child, told her that it wasn't Academy of Sinuses, it was Academy of Sinuses, uh, Academy of Sciences. So she was able to read it, and it, again and again in the book. It came many times after that. It was all about the Academy of Sciences in Paris, and she could read it, no problem. But if she had continued to struggle, and if children, whom we're listening to when they read, if they continue to struggle over the words, and only if they continue to struggle after we've told them what it is, then we stop. Only then we stop and we say, hang on, hang on. Let's sound this out and see what we get. Telling children the words keeps the story whizzing along, keeps them focused, keeps them interested, keeps them keen to continue. If you think it's cheating, look at the outcomes. Try it first and look at the outcomes before there's an outcry, before there's an uproar. You know, when I ask an audience of non-teachers what you think reading is, I'm not asking you, because you know what reading is. But when I ask a non-teaching audience, what do you think reading is? Most people say, well, making the sounds out of the letters. They think it's being able to make sounds from the print, such as Dan can fan the man, which is true, of course. It's important to know that Dan can fan the man, if that's what it says on the page. But sounding out words will only get us so far. English is so crazy, and its spelling is so irritating. I mean, take the word Wednesday, for example. Wednesday. I mean, just take that word for a start. <laughs> Wednesday. It's spelt Wednesday. Who says Wednesday? Nobody says Wednesday. We all say Wednesday. What kind of spelling is that? It must drive foreigners crazy when they try and learn English. Anyway, only 50% of English words can be read phonically correctly. 50%. 
50%. Like my name, for example, which is the, one of the easiest phonics names in the world, probably, Mem for Oxer, Mem Fox. Simple. But our goal for children, surely people, our goal for children and later ourselves, is to be able to read anything in English. Anything, not just the 50% uh, that is phonically decodable. For heaven's sake, we're going to set our goal a little higher than that, aren't we? Now, I'd like you to read this little poem to yourself. So I'm going to be quiet for a moment, and you can look at this poem by Gillian Strickland. I'm going to come back to that verse in a little moment, but of course, it was written a long time ago. So I would like to recast it in more modern terms and say you may have tangible wealth untold, caskets of jewels and coffers of gold, richer than I you can never be, for I had a father who read to me. I had an uncle who read to me. I had an auntie who read to me. I had a carer who read to me. I had a kindergarten teacher who read to me. I had... A granny who read to me. I mean, you know, all of us have the chance to be this wealth in a child's life by reading to him or to her. Now, let's go back to the original verse, which I asked you to read to yourself. Clearly, you were able to read that. I mean, I know I'm not with you, but I trust that you were able to read that verse by yourself uh, without making a sound. If I had been sitting next to you while you were reading it, I wouldn't have heard a thing. So, oh, how did you do that? How do we do that? If reading is only about being able to make sounds out of the print, why was there no sound? Mm -hmm. Because the meaning is on the page. It's not in the sound. The meaning is always in the print on the page. Also, that verse was written in English, which you and I speak and understand. And as well as that, you had seen those individual words many times before in different places, so you were familiar with them. And also, the poem happened to be on the general topic of this presentation of reading aloud to children, so there was general knowledge present as well. You made sense out of the print. You didn't have to make the sounds. When we read, we're making sense. We're making sense. We're making sense. Readers use three things always. Our knowledge of print and its sounds phonics, our general knowledge of the world, and our knowledge, in our case, of the English language. So, let's read this together. Now listen, I know you're there, and I know I'm here. I'm trusting you to read this with me, okay? Are we ready? I'm going to go one, two, three, go, and then we're all going to read it together, even though we are continents apart, perhaps. Right, so here we are. Three, two, one, go. Hib, vol, vit, rog, jet. Needless to say, we can all read that gobbledygook with ease. But, people, where does it get us? What meaning does it make? What sense? We can read it. Of course we can read it, but for what purpose? What's the point? Where's the interest? What catches our hearts and make us glad to be readers? <laughs> what part of that nonsense carries us forward in our ability to read anything real, like a poem or a story? Wouldn't it be more fun? Wouldn't it create greater interest? Wouldn't it achieve a better outcome if children were able to read instead a simple, phonically decodable sentence that makes sense, such as, or a couple of sentences, which I've written here, uh, such as, who lay in the cot? The dog, the cat, or the baby. You know, phonically simple. Who lay in the cot, the dog, the cat, or the baby? I mean, simple. Let kids work out what those two sentences say, and they're learning phonics in a way that's going to fix itself in children's heads, instead of heb, wall, vit, rog, jet. Makes me want to throw up those words. 
Honestly, it makes me mad. Oh, phonics, phonics. It is absolutely essential. Please do not think that phonics is not essential. It is absolutely essential. But on its own, it can be horribly boring and it can be rather slippery. However, it is never slippery. Phonics is never slippery. It's never boring. When it appears in words that appear in a complete sentence or story, thanks to the supporting information around it. You know, take the slippery sound A, for example. It's not always A as in apple. The A sound is not always A as in apple. Could it be the A in called? He was called to the phone. In America, you would say, say he was called to the phone, but that's still an A sound. C-A-L-L-E-D. It's a completely sound from, different sound from the A in apple. Called, called. Is it the A in baby? What's the A in baby sound like? It doesn't sound like A. We're not saying baddie. We're saying baby. B-A-B-Y. It's baddie. And you know, when you look at it as a foreigner, it must be baby. We know it's baby. The A in after in English is not the same as the A in apple. It, you know, in English, we say, in English English, people say after. In Australian English, people say after. In American English, people say after. I mean, in my town, in my town of my city of Adelaide in South Australia, the a eh in dance is different from the a eh in dance in, say, Mobile, Alabama, Ohio, Nebraska, Sydney, Australia, even in my own country, the sound A in dance changes to dance. For goodness sake. Mm. To reiterate, in English, the sounds of the language change frequently according to the geography of accents. They're not fixed. The sounds are not fixed. For example, I'm an author. In Australia, I'm called an author. But in America, I'm an author. Whose sound for the phonics of AU is correct? Is it author or author? And how about the AU sound in laugh? I mean, AU in laugh is totally different from the AU in author. It's nothing like the AU sound in author. Is it the, is it the AU as in American laugh? Is it the A-R as in an English laugh? Is it laugh as in the Australian laugh? Oh, those accents and those different phonic sounds, they change everywhere. Accents change all over the English-speaking world. But the one thing that remains constant is the meaning of the print on the page. The meaning of the print on the page never changes. It remains the same always because the meaning is on the page, not in the sounds that we make. The words, for example, in Maurice Sendak's Where the Wild Things Are, are the same, whether they are being read in Canada, in Jamaica, in Scotland, or in Chattanooga. <sighs> Am I making my point? This is, of course, as I said before, you know, my end-of-life presentation. If I'm not making my point today, I'll never make it. Let's continue. The rules of phonics are many. They are many. Alas, the exceptions to those rules, which confuse the heck out of children, are also many. I mean, look at these maddening, maddening confusions. Greet, ee, -e, and treat, sounding exactly the same. They rhyme. Greet, treat, but treat has ea in the middle, not double e. And then we go to treat and great. Both of those have ea in the middle, but they're totally different in sound. Treat and great. How annoying, how infuriating. And then we go to great and great. G-R-E-A-T and G-R-A-T-E. Great and great. They're spelt differently, but they sound the same. You can see how the meaning is actually on the page. It's not in the sound. And then we go to meet and meet. Meet with double E in the middle 
and to meet with EA in the middle. You know, the sound doesn't make the sense. It's the words on the page that make the sense. The best place to learn phonics is by writing, writing words, since words are made up of phonics. I use phonics every time I sit down and write myself. As children make the sounds of the words that they want to write, they are sounding out the letters that they need, which is why so many children in the world write to tell me that they lick my books. The reason why they lick my books is because as they're holding their pencils and putting their pencils onto the paper, they're saying to themselves, oh, I, k. For them, they have written like, but when you read it, it's lick, and children are licking their, my books everywhere. They should not do that, should they, in coronavirus times. Now, I know that we English speakers can also do this. We can read this aloud perfectly. We're going to do it together. I can trust you. I know you're going to do it, even though we're in different places. Um, shall we do it together? I will say one, two, three, go, and then we'll read it. One, two, three, go. Terima, Kasi, Banyek, Kakek, Carter, Jesse. That sentence is from the Indonesian edition of my book, Shoes from Grandpa, illustrated by Patricia Mullins. Well, well done, all of us. We read Indonesian. Woo we were brilliant at the phonics, brilliant. But because it made no sense to us as speakers of English, we weren't reading at all. We were merely barking at print. That's what it's called, barking at print. Children can often appear to be reading correctly, but it's just barking at print. They're doing the phonics correctly, but they're reading without any expression, without any understanding. They're running over commas and full stops. They've got no idea what they're saying. They've got no idea why they're saying it. They've got no idea what the story's about the sentence or anything. They are not making sense out of the words, so they are not reading, just as we weren't reading the Indonesian sentence. We cannot read if we can't make sense of something. That's what reading is, making sense. We were simply making meaningless sounds. What else did we need to make meaning out of it? Well, of course, we needed an understanding of the English language, of the Indonesian language, sorry. And we needed an understanding of the Indonesian language for a start. But hang on a minute, hang on, hang on. What if the writing is in English? It's already in English, and we are English speakers. Does that mean that because we understand English and know the sounds of the letters, that we'll be able to understand everything that we can read aloud? I wonder. Listen to me barking at print efficiently in this dense paragraph. I'll be very efficient at this reading. I'm good at reading aloud. I've had a lot of practice. I'm very old. Listen to this. The continued existence of art as a coherent concept not only serves to protect the semiological discourse from the diff difficult problematic posed by the aesthetic and the assignation of value that Taylor has shown to be part of that process, but also from the total disintegration of the very notion of meaning in the face of the aesthetics of fascination. Some clever people around who can understand that, but I have no idea what it was about. None at all. If I can't understand the words I'm reading, if I, can't, if I can sound them out correctly, but I don't understand what they're about, I'm not truly reading. If I say it once, I'll say it again and again. Reading is being able to make sense out of the print, not sounds. Now, look at this. One page left. You must be so excited. The end is nigh. I'm summing up. In order to read fluently in America, Canada, Australia, elsewhere, let alone in England, itself the home of the English language, we need to be able to speak English to read it. We need to have some general knowledge about the world. We need to be able to turn print into sounds that mean something. Each one of these is as important as the other. If we focus too much on one, such as phonics, for example, at the expense of the other two, 
children may be so damaged by the tedium of the experience that they fail to learn to read at all, or learn to read slowly and in utter misery. However, if we as teachers, parents, grandparents, carers, curriculum writers and administrators work hand in hand to ensure that language acquisition, general knowledge and phonics are equally covered, children should be able to learn to read with joy and excitement so we can all live happily ever after. Read to children, please. Thank you for listening. Stay safe. Stay sane. Goodbye.